All right. Here we go. It's right. How you guys doing? Man, I'm just pumped up. Uh, not only from Rob doing the it's time to pump you up routine thing back there. That's very encouraging and dated. But uh, yeah. And uh, but anyway, man, two new studies in one week, man. This is exciting stuff. Lots of neat stuff taking place. And uh, but before we get started, I'm going to make a couple announcements. Then we're going to do our exciting online offering, and then we'll get busy in our new study. Uh, but a couple of announcements, of course. Uh, Lord willing, for those of you guys that were tuning in uh, on Sunday, we started the new study, the AI Invasion. Uh, for those of you also uh, immediately afterwards was getting peppered with emails and social media messages, phone calls, you name it, uh, people saying, what happened to the video, where'd it go? Well, uh, while we were preaching, I was preaching on AI and the dangers of AI, specifically a section warning on the dangers of AI, a YouTube's AI literally blocked us out in real time. Usually when they do something like that, it's after the effect, but this happened as I was preaching, so that was pretty uh, weird, unprecedented, never had something like that happen before. So, but again, it, it just verifies, of course, the whole message on AI. Uh, so we were attacked by AI. So anyway, uh, but just want to mainly l uh, let you know that, uh, again, uh, YouTube is not the end of all of our studies, okay? A lot of people think that YouTube's it, that everything's housed at YouTube. No, it's not. We do our live broadcast through two different YouTube channels, the Billy Crone channel and the Billy Crone live channel. We started the Billy Crone live channel uh, in case they ever wanted to yank the primary channel. Uh, but we have two YouTube channels. We also broadcast simultaneously on two social media accounts, the Billy Chrome Facebook account and the Get a Life Media Ministries account. So we do it in four different ways to kind of spread it out in case one goes down you got options. But the biggest, most important place to always go if you can't find something, and again, a lot of them are missing on YouTube because they yank them or they just whatever, uh, ban them, block them is to the teaching website. There's a method to our madness. Many years ago, learned the lesson that don't put all your eggs I hate using that analogy. Don't put all your eggs into one basket, right? And so we have uh, built everything around the hub on our own platform, the teaching website, getalifemedia.com. What's that website, Jim? Getalifemedia.com. What'd you say, Reed? That's right, getalifemedia.com. Everything is up there, all the videos, including everything that's ever been missing on YouTube. In fact, about nine years worth of material is on YouTube, and you, or documentaries, the past documentaries, the new documentaries that you can stream and all that stuff on that website uh, through there. Uh, getalifemedia.com. So I just wanted to let you know, if you ever are missing something, we constantly get emails. Where's this? What happened to part three? Where did this go? It's al always go back to the teaching website, getalifemedia.com. That's right. So that's the first announcement. Uh, obviously, another announcement, we are on our second news study in a week, uh, Witchcraft, the Rise of Wicca. We'll get started with that in just a little bit. And then, of course, Lord willing, if we're still alive and still here, uh, Sunday, we're back in action once again with AI Invasion Part 2. Part 2. So some crazy stuff. We're going to start breaking it down, the different types of AI. Again, the dangers of AI and things of that nature. It's pretty wild. Wait till you see how far AI has gone to mimic the human voice. You can't tell it's a machine. Which means many times when you get a phone call, is that really a person? Maybe. Maybe not. So we'll see that, Lord willing, uh, on Sunday, amongst other things. But we're going to go ahead and also uh, take our offering. And uh, for those of you, of course, online, certainly the Sunrise Body, or if you're watching online and been watching online for a while, if you'd like to help us out, that would be greatly appreciated. You can do that in three different ways. You can certainly do that in, uh, if you will, the low-tech method. Uh, you can mail in your offering via a check, and you can go to the appropriate website and mail it into the address. Uh, number two, speaking of websites, you can go there, and you can click on the Give button or Donate, what have you, and you can give electronically there. Uh, or you can, right now, you can see on the screen there's a texting option, so you can text and give in that way as well. So we're going to pray for tonight's offering, and then we'll pray for our study. So let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for tonight, and thank you again for... Uh, as always, most importantly, for saving us through Jesus. Thank you for giving us the gift of eternal life. Uh, and certainly is what we're going to take a look at tonight. It's uh, very dark. And we thank you that, as you tell us, when we get saved, you rescued us from the dominion of darkness. And boy, we thank you for that. And you brought us into the kingdom of your son, the kingdom of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of light. And we thank you for that. We thank you, God, for the privilege it is to, to serve you. Uh, to seek you, to grow up, uh, to become a disciple this side of heaven, to, to, to hopefully be used of you to bear much fruit. That's why we're still here. And we thank you for it is the privilege to even give back to you. And so we do that uh, even now in faith with this offering. We, we pray, God, that you would bless it, that it would work towards you being glorified, that we, your church, would be edified, built up stronger, 
uh, the means of which that we become stronger, better, more effective, fruitful disciples for you. And as always, God, that it would also be blessed so that it would go towards other souls being saved, that the gospel will go forth here in Las Vegas and around the world, even through technology, and that we could be used of you by your spirit to win as many people to you in these last days. Oh, God, please bless this offering now. But God, also, please bless your word tonight as we take a look at it. Uh, Old Testament, New Testament, if there's one thing that we should never mess with, certainly is your people, you're very blunt about it because you love us, and that is don't ever get involved in occult practices. And you're very strong about it, and we thank you for that because you know more than anyone how dark, how deceptive, how deceitful, how deadly these things are, and it is not a game. Evil is real, Satan is real, demons are real, the occult is real, and that is not something to glamorize or even flirt with. So God, help us as your people to stick true to your word and help us to get equipped on now as we turn to the occult and let us get equipped and not to be afraid, but to learn so that we could reach those who are even involved in the occult because even they can be saved as well. You can save anyone. So please bless our study even tonight. We ask all this in your wonderful name, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Hey, that's right. We are in our study, World Religions, Cults, and the Occult. That's right. I can't believe it. He's not here, but I know it's Pastor Tom. He's been praying. He finally got us to this third section there, Jim. It took 18 years, but who's counting, right? And that's right. We are in the occult, finally. And we're starting with the occult. We're starting with what? That's right. Witchcraft and the rise of Wicca. Okay, and again, as I open up in prayer, uh, the occult is something you do not want to mess with. You don't want to flirt with. You don't want to sneeze at it. You don't want to glamorize it. Nothing. And God gives very strong warnings about it. Okay, and so that's going to be our first opening text tonight is in the book of Leviticus. Old and New Testament, man, don't mess with the occult. Okay, but Leviticus is going to be our opening text. Leviticus chapter 20, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, and uh, page 181 on my Bible there. Uh, if you have the large prints, page 517, maybe, possibly, I don't know. Solemn time, Leviticus, shouldn't be too bad, it's only the third book in, and uh, once you get past the content, and uh, Leviticus 20, verse 1 through 8, let's take a look. Should we mess with the occult and occult practices? Not at all. Man, listen to what God said to, to Israel, uh, and it, the, my heading is punishments for sin, which includes witchcraft. But he first mentions another sin that I don't think we often think about, but we've dealt with in our study, abortion, the mass murder of children. But here's what he says. Verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites, any Israelite, how many Israelites? Any Israelite or any alien living in Israel who gives any of his children to Molech. Now, who was Molech? We saw in our abortion study, Molech uh, doing the study was the uh, demonic uh, entity this, this statue that people would uh, actually, they would heat it up from the inside and become burning rot, uh, hot red, and they would throw their children literally into the arms of Molech alive because they thought that that would gain them, uh, you know, success in life and, and favor and things of that nature, okay? And before we would sit there, oh, that's crazy. Who would ever do that? Well, what is, again, I'm not going to redo that whole study. We did it well, for eight weeks, abortion, the mass murder of children. But what are people doing today with abortion? They're murdering children. Why? For the ex sake of what? Oh, I don't want to, a child to mess up my life. It's for my own gain, right? Because I don't want to mess with my job. I might have to quit. I might have to be responsible and take care of this job, right? It's the same thing, okay? But what's God said about that practice? Not only then, but dare I say today, it must what? It must be put to death. Don't mess with that, okay? You know, how dare you kill your own children, right? God's very serious about that. And he says, and the people of the community are to what? Stone him. I've said it before. I'll say it again. That is not marijuana, Jim, Okay, don't even go there, right? They're talking about rocks, and they're literally rocked to sleep. Okay, you die. Uh, okay, you are going to die. And he says, and God says, I'll set my face against that man. I will cut him off from the people for what? For killing your children, right? For giving his children to Molech. He's defiled my sanctuary, profaned my holy name. If the, now listen to this, there's a, there's a backhand to this. If the people of the community close their eyes when that man gives one of his children to Molech, and they fail to put him to death, what's God going to do? I'll set my face against that man and his family and will cut off from their people, both him and all who follow him, in prostituting themselves to Molech. So there's a, there's a backhand story. It wasn't just the person who actually killed the child. It's the people who know better and who know that's wrong and who know what God said. And he says, don't you dare do it. And here's how you're supposed to handle it. And they keep their mouth shut and don't do nothing. Do you think God is pleased when his people, dare I say even Christians today, keep their mouth shut 
on the sin of abortion and the murdering of children? Better speak up. And, of course, we dealt with that for eight weeks, right? But, so, that's serious, right? Man, murder of children. How many guys say God doesn't like that? Okay, but now, that's the first one. Now, the very second one, he says, I'm also going to set my face against somebody else. So, you thought that was bad? Here's another rotten, horrible practice that God can't stand. And he says, you better stay away from it. He said, I'll also set my face against the person who turns to what? Mediums and spiritists. What's that? That's the occult, right? Who what? To prostitute himself. What's he mean by there? You got one foot in the world. One foot in God. You're playing games with God. You show up on Sunday, if you will, to use the vernacular for today, but during the week, it's, you're living for this world. And dare I say, even the evil things of this world. You're prostituting himself by following them, and I will what? I will cut him off from his people. Same thing with the issue with murdering children. He says, therefore, here's what you're supposed to do. My people, God's people, consecrate. What's that mean? It means to set yourself apart. Set yourself apart for God right? And be holy because I am the Lord your God. Keep my decrees and follow them for I am the Lord who makes you holy. So God makes no bones about it. Again, this is one of many, 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 many passages, Lord willing, we're going to get in our study, okay, that says you don't want to mess with the occult practices. And again, the first one that we're dealing with tonight is witchcraft and the rise of Wicca. This is just the first of many that we're going to be dealing with. And again, we're just going to take our time. We're not in a hurry and we're just going to go down this route as creepy as it is, and deal with it. Okay, now we're going to take a look at several different things concerning witchcraft and the rise of Wicca. And the first one, of course, is going to be the definition, right? The definition of the term itself, witchcraft. Let's take a look at that. Uh, the word witchcraft, it, believe it or not, is over a thousand years old. It's an old English word, and it's made of a compound. I've already written it up here. It's from wicked craft. Okay, this means, of course, witch. Okay. And this, of course, means craft. So that's how the breakdown of it. Now, there's a couple variances of the spelling there, of the first part there. Uh, it's also spelled uh, Wicca, like that, with a Y. But it's also spelled straight up from the Old English, Wicca. Now, the reason why I bring that up is because don't let anybody tell you, oh, Wicca, that's not witchcraft. You guys, that's a bunch of baloney. That, that, that's old old hat stuff. That, that we, we aren't involved in that. We're just out there worshiping it. The name Wicca literally means witch. That's what it means. I mean, direct spelling of it. So, and it is witchcraft, uh, period. So don't let anybody fool you with that. So that's the, the, the definition of the word. But witchcraft, continuing with the definition, is the exercise or invocation of supernatural powers, i.e. demonic, to control people or events involving sorcery or magic, okay, and things of that nature. Uh, and it clearly is demonic. Now, they want to say, no, that's the gods and goddesses intervening for us because we conjured them up. No, it's a demon. No, that's the nature spirits. No, that's a demon. No, that's our uh, incantation, our spells that we put together to summon the, the nature spirits. No, that's a demon. Okay? No, that's the potion that we made in our cauldron with all these ingredients, and it's going to manipulate people with some supernatural force that we don't understand. No, that's demonic. Okay? But that's what witchcraft literally means okay so that's just the bare bones definition of it okay now we're going to look at the different types of witches witches are basically all over the planet throughout history for a long time not just some american phenomenon and not just with the ladies with the big giant noses and the giant black hats okay it goes way back and it's basically in almost every culture even the african culture asian culture we'll get to that if we can get that far tonight but i want to give you different types of witches out there now one of the most popular, well-known ones, at least in Western society, the type of a witch is called this, the old crone, right? Uh, and uh, I'm just going to have to put that up there. Now, I know you would laugh at that uh, for some strange reason, and so let me uh, verify and add some proof for those of you who might be wondering. Uh, we are not witches, uh, my family and I. My wife is not a, don't say that's my wife, don't say that's my mom, don't say it's my sister, not even my daughter. Uh, crones uh, have nothing to do with witchcraft. I kid you not, my daughter actually did, not because of this, but she actually did the genealogy. Our last name, Chrome, is German from crown, okay, uh, which means royalty, and we actually did the genealogy, and we're from a, a lineage of royalty, of kings and queens. I kid you not, she, all the way, what, the first century? Man, it went way back there. It was pretty cool uh, with that. I'm not saying that to boast, but we are not witches, Okay, the second thing that you're going to see, we're going to see in witchcraft uh, and other occult practices like voodoo and stuff, they're very big on chicken. 
And you know I hate chicken, so there's no way I could be a witch. Okay, but anyway, but, uh, seriously. Uh, but the old crone is the first one, okay? And uh, as you can see there, uh, uh, was out in the sun too long, ate chicken. I don't know said, what happens to you, whatever. But seriously, but that's called the crone. The old crone's the first type of witch. And uh, these uh, types of witches, because there's many different types, these types of witches, quote, meet secretly at night, indulge in cannibalism, with uh, orgiastic rites with the devil and perform black magic. So all kidding aside, this is bad stuff. You don't want to be involved uh, with any kind of witchcraft. You don't want to be any type of a witch, okay? And again, l- we go through this, and we're going to deal with this again in, in great detail. But how many times do you say, oh, no, uh, I, I'm not involved in, in black magic, right? I, I do white magic. Really? It's the same thing. You know, evil's evil. You can, it doesn't say, like, only a particular color of evil, right? You can, you can, or a different size. No, it's, it's evil, right? You could have fried chicken. You could have boiled chicken. You have baked chicken. Guess what? It's all evil, pro- folks, right? So you can call it what you will. Black magic, white magic, it's all the same thing. You don't want to be involved in it. But let's continue on with, that's right, <clears throat> somebody who I'm not related to, the crone, the old crone. Uh, the crone is an old woman uh, type of witch who may be, listen, disagreeable, malicious, and sinister in manner, often with magical or supernatural associations. The crone is supposed to be a wise woman, right? Uh, in fact, in the indigenous cults, uh, in occult, uh, certainly in the shamanism, American Indianism, but even in Africa and the different ones involved in witchcraft and, and sorcery and things of that nature, they would go see not just the wise person, but the wise man or the wise woe man, in this case, okay, because they had powers that nobody else did. In fact, oftentimes you would hear the term that they would go to not a doctor, but a what? A witch doctor, okay, because they are supposed to have this wisdom and secret. So they were considered this wisdom, but of course it's demonic. Uh, The word chrome, uh, not related to me, uh, (laughs) became further specialized, uh, dealing with the, quote, triple goddess that was popularized in some forms of neo-paganism. Now, what's neo-paganism? Neo, neo, new the new form of paganism, we're going to get into that later as well, and Wicca, which is a part of that. Uh, but also, again, popularized in Wicca as well. She symbolizes the, quote, dark goddess, the dark of the moon, the end of the cycle, and uh, together with the mother and the maiden, she represents the part of the circle of life, okay? Eventually, we're going to get into the practices of witchcraft and the things that they do and circles and pentagrams and, and all the things that they do and, and all that symbolism. So, again, we're just getting into the different types, okay? Um, now, here's what's interesting. In New Age, now, again, we're still on the topic of the first witch, the crone, the old crone, okay? Uh, in New Age and, listen, feminist circles, Okay, they, uh, even feminism, they do spiritual circles that they call cronies. Okay, now that right there tells you uh, the root, as we've seen before in other studies, of feminism. Feminism has nothing to do, folks, about higher pay, equal rights, I can prove that I can do everything a man can do. Uh, The roots of the modern feminist movement is drawing ladies into the occult, specifically witchcraft. Feminism uh, has spiritual circles called cronies, which again is a type of a witch, and is a ritual rite of passage into an era of wisdom, freedom, and personal power, right? And that's what the, the feminist movement, hey, ladies, you got to just hate the men. Men are all horrible people, right? And you need, you need personal power. You need freedom from those chains, right? And, and, and you need to have this wisdom. Well, you find out, you keep going down the route, is they're indoctrinated you into witchcraft, Okay, now we've seen this before, but let me give you an example. This is the modern feminist movement, and tell me that they're not involved in witchcraft. But let's take a look at this real quick. The women's movement today is being called the women's spirituality movement in great part. And that's because it's not just concentrating on areas of social and political reform, but it's looking hard and fast at spiritual reform. Women are gathering today in circles just as their 1960 counterparts did in consciousness raising circles. But now they're not just knocking down that door to a man's world asking for entrance. Instead, they're looking at the myths, spiritual beliefs, religions, values, everything that runs our culture, everything that feeds our souls. We're going to take a look at the women's spirituality movement, as it's been called, by the women participating in it who are weaving new stories of a returning goddess. They believe she's back on the planet, alive and well. And she can do a lot for you. The goddess is alive. Magic is afoot. The goddess is alive. Magic is afoot. The 
What the goddess means to me is wholeness and peace. The goddess means to me my internal strength. She has come to me and shown me the beauty that is within myself. The goddess is my voice. She is my self-empowerment. She's my self-respect. As a result, my life has really undergone some major transformations, not only creatively, um, but in the pathway that I have now started to take. And I have, uh, I have the works of Z Budapest to thank for that. The goddess is alive. The goddess is alive. The goddess is alive. times did you guys hear them say this is all about equal rights equal pay we need to demonstrate to a man no when you peel back the layer of what's really going on with the feminist movement the founders and even today what is it it's a spiritual movement that is leading people into these spiritual circles the cronings okay which is straight out of witchcraft okay so if anything you get involved in the feminist movement today what they're trying to do is turn you into an old crone okay it's straight out of witchcraft. It's crazy, okay? Now, let me give you a couple of examples of other uh, crones, not just here in the uh, Western culture, but the Norse myth, Thor, uh, supposedly wrestled a crone called Eli, or Eli, and there was a Slavic uh, tradition of a, a witch uh, named uh, Baba Yaga, okay? Not to be confused with Baby Yoga, uh, Yoda, uh, that's a different thing, uh, but that was uh, supposed to be a crone, a witch from the other world. Uh, but that's just the first one. Now, the second one, is this one, another type of witch, okay, it's called the black uh, anise, okay, also known as the black agnes or the black anna. Now, this is a type of a boogeyman, you heard that term? Oh, by the way, this is going to be kind of fun for those of you hooked on uh, language and history, uh, because you're going to see even tonight, and probably as, as we continue our study, there are so many words in our English language and phraseologies that we use even today, believe it or not, come straight out of witchcraft, the occult, and or things that people throughout history uh, did to protect themselves from the occult. And we still say them today, but we don't realize it. So I'll just give a little teaser. Uh, but Boogeyman, okay, has stuff to do, uh, is this lady. Uh, this is English uh, folklore. As you could see, she was a blue-faced hag or witch with iron claws and a taste for human flesh, especially children. Boy, that sounds pretty gross. Witches and human flesh. and uh, do, do the, the cult, they don't still do sacrifices of children and human yeah they do and we'll get to that unfortunately uh later but she uh supposedly lived in a cave with a great oak tree at the entrance oak trees are big in the occult we'll get into that eventually uh certainly when we get to the aspect of druids down the road uh, she is said to venture out at night looking for unsuspecting children and lambs to eat then tanning their skins and by hanging them on a tree before wearing them around her waist she would reach inside houses to snatch people and legend has it that she used those big giant claws, as you can see there, uh, to carve her house uh, out of a um, sandstone cliff. Uh, she was known also to hide in the branches of her oak tree, waiting to leap on <laughs> unsuspecting prey. Uh, other traditions stated that when she ground her teeth, people could hear her, which gave them time to bolt their doors and keep away from the window. Well, why would you do that? Because that's when she would reach in and try to snatch you. Uh, in fact, it's even said that the cottages in England have you ever been over there and saw the actual old cottages when we were over there driving doing the Rapture documentary? Remember those thatch roof ones? They still had them over there, little bitty teeny windows and things. But they said that they were purposely built with small windows so that black anise, this cre creature, uh, could only get one arm inside. So anyway, uh, when she howled, they said you could hear her five miles away. And then the cottagers would fasten skins across the window and place protective herbs above it to keep themselves safe. Again, the, you see in the movies with the vampire, you would use holy water and all that stuff. We're going to get into a whole study on amulets, uh, good luck charms, talismans, and things of that nature. None of those things will protect you from evil. Only Jesus Christ can. But people still do that today. But vampires, you know, they got the garlic and stuff. So a lot of those techniques that people did to try to protect them. So that's the second one. The third one, we don't think of this as a witch, but if you do the study, it's based on witches and witchcraft. And that's this thing called the fairy godmother okay is actually out of witchcraft uh and there was a supposed to be a good fairy godmother and a wicked fairy godmother but again black magic white magic 
boiled chicken, baked chicken, it's all evil, okay? But the fairy godmother is a uh, uh, entity with magical powers. And of course, the two biggest uh, uh, r- reminders of this is from where? From Disney. Disney is huge in the occult. A lot of Disney movies are based on the occult and not just the old cartoons, but a lot of their new shows is the occult, okay? But Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty, okay, deals with this aspect of the uh, fairy godmother. The fairy godmother has her roots in the figures of the fates. Uh, now you're dealing with even further back culture, uh, with the Greeks and the, and the Roman cultures, and maybe we'll get into that later. Uh, but uh, in Sleeping Beauty, they were uh, the, to decree her fate and associated with spinning, right? And they can spin your fate and things of that nature. We'll get into that probably later. But the, that's the, supposed to be the good one. She's using good witchcraft to help you out. No, it's all witchcraft. The wicked witchcraft, of course, has now been made uh, even more popular uh, with Disney's newest version with Maleficent, if that's the correct way to say that, the Walt Disney movie now with, uh, what's, her na- what's her name again? Anna Jolie playing that uh, character, okay. Uh, a dark, sinister being who is the mistress of evil and lays curse on the uh, prince or princess, what have you. Also, it's depicted, and this is all witchcraft, uh, depicted in what's called not just uh, the fairy godmother, including the wicked one, uh, but also the evil queen, which is another story on um, the uh, aspect of Disney on Snow White. Snow White, you're dealing with witchcraft also in that. The main antagonist, of course, to Snow White was who? The evil queen. Now, the evil queen, the whole Snow White thing, came out of the German fairy tale recorded by the Brothers Grimm. And uh, the evil queen, as we know, if you've ever seen that, designs a number of plans to kill Snow White through the use of witchcraft. Right? Witchcraft, okay, not just with the poison apple, but what was another big thing in that thing? She'd always look at the mirror, mirror on the wall, right? And she was jealous and all that stuff. Well, why do they bring up the mirror? It's just, just well, this lady was just extremely vain and just had a bad attitude and she was jealous and that's why she wanted to kill her? No. <clears throat> Take a little detour here tonight real quick. Mirrors are huge in the occult, okay? When you see mirrors depicted in these kind of movies, even cartoons, it's all about the occult. Now, what I'm going to read to you is straight out of occult pages of people who think this is great, so they admit that mirrors are huge, right? Now let me give you that. They say a mirror is a tool for divination and magic. Mirrors, they believe, will enable you to perceive the unseen. Mirror gazing can be used to uh, aid in supposedly healing, answering questions, find lost objects or people. And the power of mirrors or on any reflective surface uh, will uh, uh, reveal what is hidden. Now there's another term for this. It's not just using the mirror. Uh, but is a term we'll probably get into later into our further study into other paganistic practices. But it's a term called scrying. Scrying is what you're talking about, looking into a mirror or a reflective surface uh, and supposedly getting some sort of a vision. But gazing on shiny surfaces is one of the oldest forms of scrying. Uh, scrying. It's a method of divination practice. Listen how long this has been going on. By the early Egyptians, the Arabs, the Magi, Persia, Greeks, and Romans. In fact, in Greece, the witches of Thessaly reputedly wrote their oracles in human blood on mirrors. Okay. Uh, in fact, the Romans, listen to this, Romans were skilled in mirror reading. The ones who were skilled in mirror reading were called speculari, which is where we get the English word to speculate. But that's a person who was in divination, skilled in mirror seeing, okay, with that nature. Uh, in Christian lore, and this is from the occult site, it says mirrors enable demons to make themselves known. Yeah. This might sound kind of freaky, but let me share with you a story, and then let me back it up with uh, some occult uh, beliefs. Uh, One of our best friends in Bible college, a gentleman, I'll just say his name is Jerry, he shares of what he was going through, the spiritual torment before he got saved, and he was in Sacramento at that time, and he was living in a flat, you know, kind of a multi-story thing that was rented out, and uh, he didn't know it at the time. He found out later, after the fact, but there was uh, uh, some guys above him that lived above him, and they were witches. And he said they would mess with him all the time. And he says it wasn't because he was drinking and doing drugs or whatever. He said he'd sit there at night, and these little creatures would literally walk out of the mirror. He had a big mirror in the room, and walk back in and just kind of go in and traverse between the two. And, and he says, man, that would just freak me out all the time. And they found out later that these are witches messing with him up above, doing all these spells and things. Okay, and as soon as he found out, what did he do? Yes, he left. He got out of there. And this was before he even got saved. 
Now you think, well, that's just a bunch of baloney. That's No. And again, from the occult website. Mirrors and the application of mirrors also are, a, quote, a transit gate to other planes of existence. Okay? A body can go right through the mirror and provide access to the astral plane. Okay? And with repeated practices, you can even have meetings with the dead are possible. Now, of course, what is happening, if you do see something or something begins to communicate through this uh, witchcraft practice, uh, it's not an actual person. Hey, look, Cleopatra appeared. No, it's not Cleopatra. It's a demon. The Bible calls it a familiar spirit because the Bible is clear. When a person dies, if you're saved, you go straight to heaven. 2 Corinthians 5, 8, absent from the body, straight to be with the Lord. If you're not a Christian, if you're not uh, of the redeemed, you go straight to hell. And there is no coming back. They're not traversing back and forth and, and things of that nature. Okay, and uh, so uh, if something does appear, okay, you're dealing with a demonic influence, what the Bible calls a familiar spirit. And again, we'll probably have a whole study on that as well. But that, that's what they believe. And listen, one can visit, and this is through mirrors, that you can tap into another realm, the occult believes, into the astral plane, and visit, listen, lower planes. And again, this is from the occult website. And then what will appear are such things as gnomes. Now, what's a gnome? Well, that's just something you put in your yard, right? No, it's just a cartoon. No, gnomes, leprechauns, if you do the study, and that, there's creatures, fairies, things of that nature. Uh, a lot of this is straight out of the occult. These are entities uh, that appear and things of that nature. Uh, but gnomes are typically what? Small. So go back to Jerry's story. These little creatures coming in and out of a mirror, does that really sound weird now? I don't know. Starting to stack up. Right? But this is the weird, wacky, evil part of witchcraft you don't want to mess with. Evil is real. Don't go down this route. Uh, but also they say you can visit lower planes and not only tap into, quote, gnomes, but salamanders. We'll probably get into this once we get into the practices of witchcraft. Lord willing, salamanders, the eye of the newt right, is big, uh, salamander not only being a symbol uh, in the occult, but also an ingredient when you make your cauldron and all the different things, the potions that you're going to manipulate people. Again, it's all demonic, uh, demonic. Also, they said that you can tap into these things called uh, sylphs. I guess that's how you would say it, sylphs, okay, or you can tap into other creatures, not just gnome sylphs, but these other things called undines, or however you pronounce that. Now, you're saying, well, what's a sylph? A sylph is supposed to be an air spirit, and an undine is a, quote, female spirit or a nymph that inhabits water, okay? So, again, uh, mirrors, take it for what it is. They're big in the occult. Uh, again, that's why it was depicted uh, in Snow White. It wasn't just because the lady was being vain, because she was a witch, and witches use these in occult. In fact, let me give you uh, an example of how people involved in the occult today, unfortunately, are still using mirrors. And they believe that mirrors are a big part of your paraphernalia if you're going to be involved in the occult. But look, watch what this lady says. Oops. I wanted to tell you the power of mirrors. If you can have a mirror on you, wear it. Because it reflects back everything back to anybody that sends any kind of evil your way. Even good stuff, you send it right back to them. You can, like capture energies with mirrors too if you do find jewelry that has mirror in it i will cleanse it first before you put it on you and before you enchant it anyway i have a couple of these another way um you can reflect negative energy back onto somebody is if you when you're walking towards that person or that person is walking towards you or you're going in an area where there's a a vortex of like icky icky energy you want to see yourself as a mirror so you transform into a big mirror and you just reflect everybody's image right back on them sad still used today most people don't get it, don't realize it, uh, but man, I'm, I'll just encourage you, as I've been doing ever since I came across this video, don't know if that person is still alive, but uh, uh, if they are, pray for them, you know, obviously being uh, snookered. But let me back up there, I skipped over a couple of pictures. N this is an, a classic passage of the fairy godmother. Now, this is supposed to be the good fairy godmother, but notice what she's doing. She's, that's her cauldron, but it's a giant pumpkin, right? But still kind of looking kind of creepy. Disney's cleaned her up. Okay, but clearly in the classic literature, even the good fairy godmother was clearly involved in witchcraft, okay, uh, as seen there. And then, of course, Disney cleaned up uh, the evil queen, but that's basically you're looking at a witch is what you're 
uh, dealing with there. But in Russian folklore, let's get back to the mirrors. Mirrors are linked to the devil, according to the Russian folklore. Again, witchcraft is all over the world. Uh, and the, the Russians believe that bec- it's the mirrors are linked to the devil because they have the power, they believe, to draw souls out of the body. And here's something. How many guys ever grew up and they said, whatever you do, don't break a mirror because if you break a mirror, you get what? Seven years bad luck. Again, you're going to learn a lot of stuff that we do and say that actually came straight out of witchcraft. Now, the reason why they say that is because they say this is the occult. Breaking a mirror is bad luck because they believe that the mirror can hold the soul. And if a broken mirror, then it means it will damage your soul. Okay. So, again, that comes straight out of witchcraft. And, of course, it's superstitious. It's not true, but people still do it. In voodoo, we'll probably have a whole study just on voodoo. Uh, they have a magical mirror that they use. It's called the menor, M-I-N-O-R-E, if that's how you pronounce that. But only the priest and the priestess can use that. Okay, as well. Uh, both flat mirrors and concave mirrors are also used in magic, witchcraft. Other shiny reflective surfaces will work as well, such as the crystal ball. Uh, another big thing that's depicted in Disney, but other people, the crystal ball. Also crystals, crystals, period, right? But basically any reflective surface, including if you just get a bowl of water. Remember, the practice of scrying is you look at any reflective surface. Could be a mirror, could be a crystal ball, could be just water. You can see the reflection. And basically what you do is you take drugs. We'll have a whole study on how important drugs are in the occult, let alone witchcraft. And people today are taking drugs. Oh, it's just entertainment. No, no, it's not. You're doing the same thing the occult does, specifically to open up spiritual doors, which is demonic. You don't want to mess with that. And aren't you glad they're legalizing marijuana, which is opening people up to all kinds of demonic aspects? We'll get to that in another whole study. But bowls of water. Now, that brings us back to uh, a gentleman that we've talked about before. I'm not going to go down super deep because we've dealt with him many times in other studies. But a guy uh, called Nose Hair Damas. Okay, I mean Nostradamus, but uh, Nostradamus was a 16th century French physician and astrologer. Uh, he wrote these four uh, uh, verse line things called quatrains and said that people say he was a prophet. He was a prophet. Well, he was involved in, he used this reflective service, scrying, okay, witchcraft, and to get these supposed uh, quatrains. I don't have time to get into it. We dealt with this before in other studies, but those quatrains are so incredibly vague. Anything could stick in there. It's ridiculous. Okay, but I want you to uh, listen to this. He used a combination and divination, and he claimed that a, quote, spirit, which would be a demon, helped him understand how these things work. He used various forms of meditation, focusing on fire or water, while being under the influence of mild hallucinogens, right? And again, that's scrying. Now, this is used by witches, and what you do is you concentrate, with, oftentimes with the help of drugs, you concentrate on a reflective surface, something shiny or whatever, until you start to see visions appear, including like a crystal ball. Uh, Nostradamus not only knew he was messing with dangerous occult practices, but it's on record he even warned his son, don't you dare do what I did. And I quote, he beseeched his infant son never to dabble in such practices, for he says they desiccate or dry up the body, they disturb the mind, and send the soul to perdition or hell. For that reason, he burned to ashes the ancient books he learned these techniques from, and when he did, he said they burn with an unnatural brilliance. Uh, Just by nature, you guys know my testimony, this was, nobody gave me a sermon, Uh, I certainly didn't uh, have a study on the occult and witchcraft, uh, but the Spirit of God, the very next day after I got saved, man, I was clean in the house. I was involved in New Age and the occult, and I spent half a day, man, going up and down the stairs in my second-story apartment building where I was staying at the time, and I'm just getting rid of stuff. Uh, and, and that's the spirit of God. It's, you get rid of that stuff. Now, the, the reason why that sounds so familiar is because that's exactly what the occult people did when they got saved and came out of the occult. They got rid of everything. Right? Open your Bibles to Acts 19. Acts 19, we saw an Old Testament passage. Now let's take a look at a New Testament passage. Uh, if you have, uh, dare I say, before you got saved, I would assume you got rid of anything and everything involved in the occult if you're involved in that. Uh, if not, you need to get rid of it now. Uh, don't hold on to it, just get rid of it. Uh, if you got the best way I can think of, if you got the ability, get a big old uh, 50 gallon barrel and burn it. Right? And, uh, but, uh, or if you're a, a Christian and uh, you're messing with the occult, you better burn it, get rid of it, right? But uh, Acts 19, let's take a look at that. Uh, verse 13, here's what they did. Some Jews went around driving out evil spirits. Uh, they tried, notice the key word, they tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed, but it didn't work. Well, why didn't it work? 
because they weren't really saved. Watch this. It says this. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom we know personally because we're born again. No, whom Paul preaches. So they were using it like it was like some sort of a, if you will, dare I say, it, like a, a witchcraft, like a word that's going to you know, do their bidding and things of that nature. No, in whom Paul preaches. I, I command you to come out. Well, these were the seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest. They were doing this. And on one day, the evil spirit, i.e. the demon, answered them. Listen to this. Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? The last thing you ever want if you're experiencing a demonic warfare is for a demon to speak to you and say, who are you? Uh, you want them to say, oh, I know you. You're, you're, you're Jim Jubinville. You're a child of God. Think about that. You, ooh. But listen to that. And so what happened? Of course, it didn't work because they weren't saved. Jesus, I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? The man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Okay? Now, uh, and dare I say, when we get to the section on the amulets, the talismans, the luck, good luck charms, and even the Roman Catholic traditions with the holy water and all that baloney, if you're experiencing demonic warfare, you're going to get whooped on. That stuff does not work. Okay, only Jesus Christ can deliver you and save you from something like that. But continue reading. It says this. Now, when this became known, right, the name of Jesus cast out uh, 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 demons and stuff of that nature. It didn't work for them because they weren't saved. But when you're saved, all, whoa, he's, whoa. When this became known, there's Jews and the Greeks living in Ephesus. They were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. And a number who had practiced what? Sorcery, pharmacaea, witchcraft, okay, brought their what? Scrolls, right? Witchcraft, of course, relies a lot on scrolls, book of spells, things of that nature. The occult does too, okay? So they brought them together, and what did they do? Well, they hung on to them. Yeah, I mean, they paid good money for that. You don't want to get rid of that stuff. You know, I'm not, no, you get rid of this stuff. If you're involved in this or you were involved in this, get rid of it. And they what? They burned them publicly, right? When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. And in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I tell you what, with all this uh, economy weird stuff going on, I'm so glad that uh, I, we're still out there going through the drive through pain and drachmas. Yeah, we don't obviously use drachma as a currency, but listen to how what's really going on to this, and then we'll continue on. 50,000 drachmas, that's a huge, massive amount of money. These people, I don't care what it costs me. I don't care what I spent on all that occult stuff. I have got to burn it and get rid of it now. If I'm living for Jesus, I'm not going to prostitute myself to the world. It's not one foot in the world, one foot with Jesus. It's all Jesus, nothing, and I'm going to make a clean break. A drachma, one drachma, was one full day's wage. So I did the math this afternoon. 50,000 divided by 365 for the years, that is 140 years worth of pay that went up in smoke. You're talking multi-millions and millions of dollars. But hey, what's more important? Still trying to somehow look like you're a Christian and a follower of God and still somehow flirt with the occult? Or you just get rid of it? No matter the cost, because there's something greater. He's called Jesus. And he's more precious than 140 days of wages. And you need to make a clean break. Right? So that's that path. Now, it's also believed, just real quick on mirrors, we'll move on. It's also believed that mirrors would also transmit and receive thoughts, pictures, words, and sounds could be transmitted and received through magic mirrors, regardless of the distance. They act as a screen for the person involved in clairvoyance, which, again, we'll get into later. Uh, also, remote viewing. Uh, and things of that nature. Quote, a skilled magician can gaze into a magic mirror and see distant scenes and activities like he's watching a television set. Okay? So that's what they believe that those things could do. Also, an, according to another belief, uh, witches have no souls, which if a person is actually a witch, they do have a soul, but this is part of their belief. But this is also going to uh, dispel another thing that you see in the movies. They say witches have no souls, and therefore, like vampires, have no reflections in mirrors. So that's why you see in the movies, you say, oh, the vampire, what are you, no full reflection. Because they believe in the occult that that person who's a full-blown vampire doesn't have a soul. But it's not just vampires who can't see the reflection. It's also witches. Okay, but again, the mirror, witchcraft, all that stuff is still going on today. Now, let's get to the next one. Uh, and that is not just the old crone, uh, but you have what? The hag, right? The old hag, right, is what's going on there. And again, she was considered a wise woman, right, because she knew all these secret techniques, uh, but she was a kind of a fairy or a goddess uh, that appeared as a woman in folklore, also popular in, as well as the other ones in children's tales, especially Hansel and Gretel, 
right? If we're familiar with that, it was the old hag. Now, uh, the term appears in Middle English, and it's a shorten of the firm hagates, which is an old term for witch. So it's just another name for a witch, okay, is what you're dealing with a hag. In fact, it's similar to the Dutch word, instead of hagates, English says hagates, Dutch calls it hex, or the Germans call it hex spelled that way. Now, where have you heard that before? Because a hex, which is the German or Dutch word for witch, is a hex is the uh, witch casting a spell or cursing somebody. Let me give you another example of that. Uh, the, when I was pastor in Northern California, I uh, met a, a wonderful family, a great family, godly family, homeschooling family. And uh, when they were young Christians and on fire for Jesus and sharing the gospel, uh, some people moved in next door to them. They lived in a house, or the house next door to them. And um, it turns out they were witches. Well, when the witches found out that this family uh, were Christians, then the battle began. And uh, he believed, uh, the fathers, he tells me, that they were trying to curse them and put hexes on them. He says, one of the things, he said, just give you an example of the freaky stuff that began to happen. He says, is, uh, and, and I can verify this because I've been their family many a times, and they're very clean very orderly, they weren't trashy and dirty people. He said, I mean, all of a sudden, overnight, we had an influx of cockroaches like you would not believe. A massive mega in, uh, infestation, and he firmly believes it was because the witches doing hexes and casting them, messing with the Christian and things of that nature. Uh, do we, by the way, as a Christian, need to be afraid of a witch putting a curse on us and things of that nature? No, we don't. We'll have a whole study on that. Praise God for Jesus, amen? Right? But an old hag, listen to this, is going to explore some more things that you might have uh, heard in our terminology. An hag or an old hag was also a nightmare spirit. Okay, a nightmare spirit. The old hag would sit on a sleeper's chest and send nightmares to him or her. And when the subject awoke, he or she would be unable to breathe or even move for a short period of time. Today, medical people call this sleep paralysis. But in the occult, when the hag would visit you, the witch would visit you, right? Uh, what they said is the subject wasn't experiencing sleep paralysis, but here's the term. That person was hag-ridden, okay? The hag had you down. You know, we'd say bedridden, it's hag-ridden, right? It's why you couldn't move. Uh, and it's still obviously a paranormal state that people just say, oh, I don't know why it's happened. You know, hey, maybe it's just physical, I don't know. But these things can also happen in the occult as well. Uh, also, uh, the hag, that's the, the Baba Yaga, again, not to be confused, Debbie, with the baby Yoda, uh, uh, is also a type of a hag in their culture, lived in the woods. I'm not making this up. And her house, this hag's house, if you can believe this, oh, man, where can I even draw this? Uh, this is supposed to be a house, so roll with me, okay? So she got this house thing. Look at that. Hey, you know that's cool. Her house was built, and I quote, on chicken legs. Moment of silence? Besides me? Am I the only one there? Once again, proof, besides my daughter's expertise on genealogy and the R word for crone, which means crown royalty and we're not witches, um, chicken is huge for witches. Chicken, can you believe that? Her, her house was built on chicken legs. Okay, but she would ride through the forest and she would sweep away her tracks with the broom. Wait till you hear what the broom also is used for witchcraft. And what, what are they talking about when they're flying through the sky? Well, yeah, you're flying on a hallucinogen, but anyway, we'll get to that eventually. The hag is also a creature used in, guess what? The Harry Potter series. But we all know that's just entertainment, and there's no witchcraft in those books. Yeah, whatever, we'll have a study on that as well. Now, let's take a look at the next one. The next one is called Bafana, is another type of a witch. And this is a witch over in Italy. And this is going to blow your mind on some of these things. But Bafana is an old woman, as you can see there, depicted there in doll form with brooms. Uh, she is an old woman, a witch, who delivers gifts to children. Quote, in a similar way that St. Nicholas or Satan Claus, I mean Santa Claus, uh, does as well. Listen to all the similarities. And this is a witch. So don't tell me that there's not some sort of a cult background uh, with Satan Claus. People want to try to clean it up, but watch this. Some suggest that Bafana is descended from the Sabine Roman goddess named Strenia. Now, why does that sound familiar? Because Strenia 
the witch, the Roman witch, was supposed to make a person strenuous or strong. That's where we get the word strenuous from. It's from strenia, supposed to making you strong. It's like your blah, blah, blah. But Bafana, quote, visits all the children of Italy and fills their socks with candy and, pre- and presents if they're good or a lump of coal or dark candy if they're bad. Now, being a good housekeeper uh, as a witch, apparently, she will sweep the floor before she leaves, uh, and some say that uh, the sweeping means that she's going to sweep all the way your problems for that year, right? And then the child family typically leaves a small glass of wine, remember, this is the witch, and a plate of a few morsels of food. So basically, she's the female witch version of Satan Claus. It's been cleaned up today, but it's straight out of the occult. Uh, she's also portrayed, as you saw, a hag riding on a broomstick, okay, through the air, wearing a black shawl, and is covered, listen, in soot. Okay, why? Because she enters the children's house through the chimney, straight out of witchcraft. Now, lest you think that's true, in 2018, even in Italy, they came out with a Christmas fantasy featuring Bafana. It was called The Legend of the Christmas Witch. About as blunt as you can get, at least they were honest. And it featured a 500-year-old Bafana who worked as a school teacher by day. So, anyway. Now, another popular one uh, is a type of witch. It's called a sea witch. Okay, a sea witch. And gee, I wonder who's glamorizing that as well. Disney. That's right, whoever said that. Disney uh, as well. Sea witches are portrayed as women who have power regarding the sea, the weather, other aspects of seafaring life. Uh, it's big in European folklore, etc. Sea witches were witches who appeared among sailors or involved in seafaring trade, period. A sea witch may be uh, presented as a fairy, a mermaid, or what's called a, man, I'm running out of room, a selkie. And you say, what's a selkie? Well, that was back when they didn't have phones. They had to handwrite on engraving in wood. It took much longer, uh, but you know, when you're looking at yourself and you had to do, no, that's called a selfie, Jim, thank you. No, a selkie had nothing to do with that, Jim. Thanks for being here tonight. We'll lay hands on you later. But a selkie was a seal-like creature that assumes human form. So she could appear as a selkie, like a seal-like creature that can appear as human, uh, a fairy, or a mermaid. Mermaids are also big in the occult and stuff. And does that sound familiar? That sounds exactly like another Disney cartoon. Uh, and had influence uh, uh, on the sea, etc. The powers range, they can control the winds, the weather, and even influence the catches of the fishermen. Right, and uh, off- but here's some things you uh, could do to offend the sea witch. Quote: You could refuse to pay her for her services. You could insult her looks. Sorry, lady, you need help. Or uh, you could also uh, refuse to acknowledge her powers, and it could end up in disaster, and she could destroy your whole ship. But in addition to her powers over the water, again, she can control the wind, the weather, and among many tales uh, that feature is she would give the sailors uh, a rope tied in three knots, okay, that they, if they needed help. And so she would offer him her services. And unfortunately, people still do seek out witches today and the occult to, to help them along, uh, things of that nature. But they, she would get, and you say, well, why would they give them, she would give them a, a rope tied with three knots? Well, because it was to aid them on their voyage. Right? Pulling the first knot would yield a gentle southeasterly wind, supposedly, Right, because the last thing you want to do when you're out in the middle of the ocean has what? Back in the day, no wind. You're stuck. Right? If you pulled the second knot, okay, then what would happen is uh, uh, you would have a strong northerly wind, but the third knot, better not do that. It's like the shiny red button. Don't push it. Uh, that could unleash a hurricane. Right? So the term sea witch uh, may be applied to, again, uh, one who often uses water when casting spells. You're going to see that again in paganism, also witchcraft today, Wicca today. It's not just that, um, uh, that power of water, but again, water is used uh, in making these potions. Water is used as a reflective surface besides the mirror that's involved in that uh, process. But in the occult usage, the terms sea witch and water witch are basically synonymous. Now again, what is the most popular ones who's promoting this today? Again, Disney, Ursula. And Little Mermaid was the big antagonist there. Uh, also, the character in uh, Tia Dalma in the Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End was technically a sea witch. And also, for those of you hooked on video games, Warcraft 3, a sea witch is actually the hero. But let me speed it up real quick, and let me give you just a random different types of witches. There's so many different types of witches. They're all over the world. I don't think we realize how far this rabbit hole goes. Okay, But let me give you some more modern ones. And we're going to get into this when we get into witchcraft. 
But uh, the first one is what's called today, this is a modern witch called a Gardnerian witch, is someone who follows the belief of the Gardnerian Wicca. And when we get to the part on Wicca, you're going to see that Wicca, there's different aspects. Some go down this route, some go down this route, etc. This is one of the routes uh, as well. Then there's what's called the Alexandrian Witch, okay? And they follow uh, similar traditions, but they incorporate the ceremonial, uh, the ceremonial magic out of Kabbalah, the Jewish Kabbalah, as we saw before in our other studies, which is a Jewish form of mysticism and the occult. So they combine that. Uh, the Alexandrian witch. Then you have what's called the solitary witch who performs spell work and rituals all by themselves without a coven. There is no group. That could be by choice or it could be they just haven't found somebody yet. But that's a solitary witch. Another witch today would be called an eclectic witch. Someone who pulls from various witchcraft traditions for their spell work and rituals. Uh, different cultures, belief systems uh, that they combine, mix and match to make up their own witchcraft practice. Uh, to me, would be like a, a new age version. New age, as we saw before, if you're involved in new age, uh, you're in the driver's seat. You can pick from whatever religion you want and make it up as you go. It's like going down the cafeteria. If I want some Buddhism, I'll take a little bit of that. I'll take some Hinduism. I'll take some self-help. I'll take secular psychology. I'll, t I'll sprinkle a little Christianity, nothing convicting. And, and that's how, th well, that's what they're doing with witchcraft. The eclectic witch just basically draws from all different aspects and makes them up as you go. So that's another one. Or the complete polar opposite of that is called the traditional witch. And that's one that says, nope, they ain't making it up. They're going by old uh, records, old what's called grimoires or book of spells, okay, and uh, various uh, witch lore and historical accounts. So they're not making it up as you go. They're not combining, mixing, and matching. They're going on historical records. That's what's called a traditional witch. Then there's a hereditary witch. That is somebody who's born, obviously, into witchcraft, unfortunately, and uh, in their family. And so they use knowledge that's passed down through generation after generation. Uh, then there's what's called a hedge witch. A hedge witch uh, is one who works in, quote, liminal spaces. Let me spell that for you. L-I-M-I-N-A-L. -I -I and you go, what's a liminal space? A liminal space is believed to be uh, the waiting area between one point of time and space and the next. So uh, it's basically like uh, we would say there's our realm and there's what's called the spirit realm. And uh, so the hedge witch is somebody that's right there in between, kind of uh, going between both worlds, right? The reason why it's called a hedge witch is because hedges were used to mark property boundaries, right? Again, back on our trip when we were over there in Europe filming on the Rapture documentary in England, there's still big time hedges there. Hedges are used to separate. We use fences. They use hedges, right? but it marks boundaries. And so a hedge witch is one who's right there in between, the boundaries between the two different spiritual planes. Okay, then believe it or not, another modern witch today is called a kitchen witch. A kitchen witch enjoys making their home surroundings a so-called sacred space. They incorporate their witchcraft with their cooking. Can you guess what they're cooking? Yeah, that's my, I, I can't verify that yet, Jim, but I think that's true. Uh, they put their energy and focus into the food and the meals they create. Uh, and uh, they have their own herb and vegetable garden. You know, they're kind of getting back to nature. Speaking of which, back to nature, you have what's called today the green witch. Might as well call it the environmental witch. Okay, green witches are nature, extremely, quote, nature-based. Okay, and they are in tune with the seasons and often nature materials and create their own magical tools and most likely try to perform all their spell work and rituals outside in nature when possible and all that stuff. And, and if you don't think that the environmental movement is not another smokescreen to pull people into witchcraft and the occult, you're dreaming. Just like feminism, when you do the research, is pulling ladies into being an old hag and old crone, witchcraft. Okay, the environmental movement is out there worshiping nature just like witchcraft. We've seen this before, but let me give you an example. Here is an environmental movement worshiping and mourning over trees. Okay, let's take a look at this. Deep in the woods of North Carolina, an extremist eco-group called Earth First bewails the violation of American nature. I want to mourn the loss of all the old growth trees I seen and tell them that we love them and that we don't want them to die. That we are some people here who do care. So I want you to know that, Dreed, that we care. 
I think we are deeply hurting in America. I think we are deeply craving answers. I think that we've lost our identity as we have evolved into technology and into industrialized society. Bring me to this cathedral. Bring me to those guys. Bring me to this rock that has the most incredible life. That makes me feel alive. Last time I checked, rocks aren't alive. But what are they doing? They're worshiping nature, just like in witchcraft. They're speaking out to the spirits of the trees and things that... It's witchcraft is what that is. By the way, what they're doing is it is a violation of Romans chapter 1. They worship created things instead of the creator. And that really is at the heart of uh, witchcraft and the occult. But also, Romans 1 says that's why the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. Okay, then as you see there, the last one, of course, is the cosmic witch. This is a witch that in, uh, incorporates, on top of everything else, astrology and astronomy. Okay, and into their witchcraft. They follow the alignment of the planets. They will often coordinate their spells and rituals based on the location of the planets and the moon and things of that nature. But let me, real quick, we've got one more thing to, uh, to, to deal with, and uh, that is the location of the witches, real quick, okay? The definition, the types, and the location. Basically, the location, as I've already been saying, it is all over the world. I'm gonna give you just a couple quick examples. Africa, you name it, uh, even here in America. Witches are typically seen as particularly active after dusk when law-abiding mortals are asleep. That's where you get this term called the witching hour. Okay, things of that nature. Uh, according to, even here in America, American sh Indianism, shamanism, witchcraft. That's a witch talk. That's all it is. It's being glamorized big time by Hollywood, right? But according to Navajo belief, traditional, a, when a witch travels at night, he wears the skin of a dead animal in order to affect a transformation into that animal. And they call these things skin walkers. Now, why is that important? There's another new show that just came out, I believe, on historical channel, I mean, history channel, and it's a Skinwalker Ranch, and they're trying to find out what is these skinwalkers. You don't want to mess with that, man. It's all the occult. That's straight out of the occult witchcraft from American Indian uh, background. The skinwalkers hold nighttime meetings in which they wear nothing except a mask. They sit among baskets of corpses. They have intercourse with dead women, and that's just here in America, just the Indian culture. African cultures, witches are believed to assemble in cannibal covens, often at graveyards around a fire, to feast on the blood that they, like vampires, which is still going on today, believe it or not, extract from their victims. And like witchcraft here in Western society, the African witches are guilty of child abuse, uh, incest, perversions, and even murder. Witchcraft is in high gear in third world countries. It has never stopped. It's just we never see it here on the news. But let me expose to you just a little bit of that. Does sorcery exist in the modern day? Here are the facts. Belief in witchcraft predates the written word. Before early human beings learned to keep written records, they routinely paid tribute to gods for help with crops, weather, illness, hunting efforts, and more. This notion of divine intercession that otherworldly entities, be they rain gods or demons, could alter the otherwise natural course of the universe is one of the most common supernatural beliefs. Today, both the definition and origin of witchcraft are difficult to pin down. It's an umbrella term and has been used to describe a wide range of unique supernatural and spiritual beliefs around the world. And, to most in the modern age, witchcraft is an archaic thing, a relic of a time before modern science, when people cowered in the face of an inexplicable and terrifying world. But is it real? And has the world really said goodbye to witchcraft? Here's where it gets crazy. Absolutely not. In countries across the planet, sorcery and witchcraft are still a source of public disorder, vigorous debate, trials, executions, horrendous crimes, and more. Let's begin with the more lighthearted stuff such as the recent law in Swaziland banning witches from flying above 150 meters on a broomstick. If caught, the witches would be required to pay a hefty fine. While this may sound amusing, it's only a small part of a much larger and much more frightening phenomenon. 
In countries like Angola, Nigeria, Gambia, and Malawi, even children have been accused of witchcraft. Local religious or spiritual authorities will exorcise these children, often orphans, by imprisoning, beating, or starving them. This practice is not strictly limited to these countries either. In 2010, a 15-year-old boy named Christy Bamu was murdered in the UK, allegedly for being a witch. Albinos in Tanzania and neighboring countries have a particularly dangerous time, as some practicing sorcerers believe that an albino's body parts have great potency as magic charms. As a result, albinos of all ages have been viciously attacked or murdered. And in the case of murder, Uganda particularly stands out. For years, reports of ritualized human sacrifice spread, eventually getting the attention of international peacekeepers. These violent acts are not restricted to the African continent. While ritualized killings pop up across the world, the work of isolated serial killers and other madmen, other entire communities band together to take revenge on people that they perceive to be witches or sorcerers. As recently as 2013, residents of Papua New Guinea conducted witch hunts, notably torturing and beheading a teacher named Helen Rumbali. This is only one of hundreds of witchcraft cases recorded by the UN in this country. Papua New Guinea's Sorcery Act allowed for a belief in witchcraft to be used as a partial legal defense for killing someone suspected of black magic until it was recently repealed following the spike in violence against those accused of witchcraft. Most outside observers find an underlying mundane cause for these violent accusations and this pervasive belief in sorcery. Could there really be something to these accusations? Is it possible that amid the reports of madness, persecution, and crime, there really is some supernatural element, something the world's media doesn't want you to know? Yeah, it's because witchcraft is real, real and still goes on. More people don't want to believe it, even though uh, I think part of their smoke screen is to make fun of it and turn it into cartoons and things of that nature, and it's just a movie and... But no, it still goes on all over the world. Real quick, uh, in many African cultures, witches today uh, are causing, they believe, all manner of diseases, disasters, sickness, even death. Uh, Africa and Asia, Asia's uh, huge on witchcraft, uh, and uh, epidemics, natural disasters are interpreted as acts of witchcraft. Members of the certain Afro-Brazilian cults, for example, believe that even job loss uh, can be potentially due as a result of witches, doing the hex and all that stuff. And of course, what they want to do is go hire another witch and try to get that off of them, a uh, fire. It, again, boiled chicken, baked chicken, salt, it ain't going to work, right? Uh, Africans, Asians believe firmly in the reality of itchcraft, and thus people, even in those countries today, they go seek the help of a witch doctor, okay? Uh, to protect against witchcraft, they might wear amulets, take medicine, or bathe in certain witchcraft things. Uh, or even just flat out practice divination to get back at them, so to speak. The Navajo protect themselves against witches with gall medicine or sand paintings, which then leads us to the different types of protection, okay, uh, that people have. Now, again, the only protection that works is Jesus Christ. And make if you don't want to have these critters always at your door, uh, then certainly don't mess with it. But certainly, if you're not saved, you need to get saved right now, okay. Uh, and as a Christian, you shouldn't be flirting with that. But next time, we're going to get into the whole aspect of cultures around the world, unfortunately, don't listen to God, not only are engaged in these practices uh, and the people around them, but they also don't listen to God in how to have protection. Their greatest protection is, again, to get saved, right? It's at the name of Jesus Christ that men might only, uh, only his name that men might be saved, but it's also at the name of Jesus Christ that demons cower, obey, and flee, Okay, but they don't do that, and they resort to man-made techniques, occult techniques, to protect them. Okay, uh, again, I mentioned Asia. Asia, they, they're big on calligraphy, and they believe that they could write on certain pieces of paper and things of that nature, and that's going to protect them. That ain't going to work, but that's part of their culture. Uh, just to give you a little teaser, there's this device here. This is from the Arabic community. This is called the Nazar Amulet, and it's supposed to ward off the evil eye. Uh, when we were visiting uh, uh, Jerusalem, a uh, year before last, man, every knick-knack, paddywhack tourist shop had these hands, these like hand things going on there. Well, even the Jewish people get involved in this superstition. That's supposed to be the hand of Miriam that's supposed to protect you from the evil spirits and things of that nature. And on and on it goes. It's sad. It's unfortunate. But it shows you that people do believe that witchcraft's going on. Unfortunately, they make mistake number two, and they try to fight witchcraft 
with witchcraft. But we'll get to that, Lord willing, next time. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for our study tonight. And once again, we just thank you for your word that gives us clear warning that this is not just real, but we really don't want to mess with it. And so, God, please, uh, if anyone's watching, any of us are, uh, uh, the word you use is prostituting. Uh, one foot in the world, including with the occult, and one foot with you, you're not blind and deaf. You see everything. Help us, God, to make a clean break tonight. As your people, we should have nothing to do with this stuff. And so also, God, if there's anybody watching that is involved in the occult, maybe they're like that lady we saw in the video that's clearly straight up involved in the occult, think it's great, and are using all the paraphernalia, including mirrors, to provide protection and give them peace. And think None of that will work. God, would you please save them, even tonight? Even that girl, God, if she's still alive, still, uh, and if she's not saved, would you please save her tonight? But God, please, um, please have mercy on them. God, as you know, I was involved in the occult. I wasn't even looking for you. And yet you chased me down and you saved me. Would you please do that to a ton of souls, even tonight, even through this study? We ask and pray this in your wonderful name, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Well, hi, this is Billy Crone of Get Life Ministries, and I hope you were blessed with this study. But in closing, let me ask you one final question. If you were to die today, are you sure that you go to heaven and not hell? Before you answer that, let me share a couple of things that the Bible says. Did you know that the Bible says that God is holy and that we are not? And the wages of our sin or unholiness is death? In other words, we deserve to die and go straight to hell and be separated from God for all eternity. This is the great cosmic dilemma. God who is holy and we are not, how can we have a relationship with Him? The two will never mix. Now, to make matters worse, we don't even want to admit this, even though God already knows He's God. And so God, out of love, gave us something called the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were not something to just memorize or stick on your wall or give the appearance of being a religious person. The Ten Commandments were God's divine x-ray, if you will, into our heart and soul to reveal this truth that we need to admit. And that is this, that God is holy and that we are not. We are disqualified for heaven. So let's take a look at that divine x-ray that God's trying to get us to realize. Uh, the, the Ten Commandments, the, the ninth one says, you shall not bear false witness. That's lying. Okay. How many guys have ever told a lie? Raise your hand. Okay. Well, if you didn't raise your hand, you just did. You just told a lie because we've all done that. Well, that makes us a liar. The, another Ten Commandments says that you shall not steal. Don't ever take anything without permission. How many of you guys uh, have ever done that? Well, you guys already said you're a bunch of liars. All of our hands should have went up on that one. And for being honest, God already knows. Folks, we've all taken something. We've stolen something, right? That makes us a thief. Another Ten Commandments says that you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. He's not just holy. Even His name is holy. Hey, folks, let's be honest. If you can believe it, even the name of Jesus Christ uh, has been turned into a common cuss word. Well, the Bible says that's a sin of blasphemy. Now we're a, a blasphemer. The Bible says you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus said, here's his standard. Uh, uh, even if you look at another person with lust in your eye, you committed adultery in your heart. Wow, so now we're an adulterer. The Bible says you shall not murder. And you might think, well, hey, at least I haven't done that one. Really? Again, the Bible says that the sin of hatred, wishing somebody was dead, okay, that, that's the same thing. Uh, it's akin to the sin of murder. It's just you pulled the trigger in your heart, but God sees the heart. Hey, folks, that's just five out of ten. How are you doing? You still think you're going to get to heaven on your own? You still think that you're qualified, that you're holy like God, and you could bridge the gap and have a relationship with Him forever? I don't think so. I mean, what did we just see? You're going to stand before God, and so am I. We all are. And we're going to have to give an account for who we are. Hey, hey, God, let me in. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a liar. I, I'm a thief. I'm a blasphemer. I'm an adulterer. I'm a murderer. And the Scripture is very clear, folks. Such people as these will not inherit the kingdom of God. We're in trouble. But folks, here's the good news. The Bible says that if we would just admit that, that's the first step. To admit that God is holy, that I'm not, I'm disqualified for heaven, I need a Savior. If we would admit that and then ask for the Savior to save us. That, that's what God was doing with Jesus. God gave us His Son, Jesus Christ. He took the death penalty in our place so that we could be completely forgiven of everything we've ever done and be made holy 
through Jesus so that we can now have a relationship with God both here and now and forever in heaven. We can become qualified. The word that the Bible uses is a word called pardon, that God is willing to pardon us of all of our sins and crimes that we've committed against him and disqualified us, that disqualified us for heaven, right? And we've actually seen this work in real life. Uh, for instance, uh, there's been people who have committed crimes, gone to court, the gavel's been passed, the judges said, hey, listen, we all know you're guilty, uh, you even admit you're guilty, and uh, for your crimes, you're going to not just jail, you're going to uh, await in jail to go to the death penalty. And did you know that there actually is a way that somebody could get off of death row? It's called a pardon. The one in the authority, the governor, can grant what's called a pardon for that person's crimes, and they literally can go free. Not because of something they did, because the deeds are already done, you can't undo it. Not because of they tried to clean up their act while they were stuck in the jail cell, because that doesn't change anything. But simply out of mercy, the person who has the authority can give them a pardon, and they can go free. And did you know it's actually on historical record that there have been people who have been granted a pardon from the death penalty, and they've refused to take it. And so even though the offer was there to be set free, they themselves still had to go to the death penalty. Folks, in a nutshell, that's what God's doing every single day with all of us this side of heaven. While you still have breath, you still have an opportunity to receive God's pardon. He's willing to forgive you of all your sins if you would just receive His pardon through Jesus Christ. Again, that's what He was doing on the cross. The cross was the death penalty of the day. But since we weren't there, and since we can't earn it, it's a gift from God, you have to receive that by faith. Reach out even today from your own spiritual jail cell, if you will, and say yes to Jesus and God's pardon so that you can be set free and go to heaven. The Bible says that if you will confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the grave, you will be saved. Hey folks, if that's you, don't delay. You may not even have tomorrow. Today could be your last day. Please accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Confess with your mouth He is Lord. Believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the grave and the Bible says you will be saved. Well, this has been Billy Crone of Gill Life Ministries. If there's anything that we could do for you, our information and, and number will come up here shortly. And please don't hesitate to contact us. But remember, I hope to see you in heaven. God bless.